it. To those who have come to realize that the world's religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt, that they've become counterproductive, and that they cannot be fixed. I am Yada. Our number normally for these shows is uh, is toll free for you to participate, but today I'm coming to you not live, but that doesn't mean I'm dead either. No, we pre-recorded this program uh, for you uh, yesterday uh, for you to hear today. Uh, and. Uh, we did so because I am now on the road moving from uh, Central California uh, to Virginia uh, with a stopover in Ohio en route to, uh, to enjoy uh, uh, family. Uh, because this is a Friday program, we're going to begin uh, today with the Torah. Uh, for those who listened to yesterday's show, you know that Kirk and I made our way uh, through a significant portion of a marvelous statement from Yahweh. It says, and a son of eight days, you shall circumcise, you shall separate uh, to, uh, for the approach of every male, for them to approach throughout your dwelling places and generations. For those naturally born in the home, but also for those really wanting to be acquired and included, who are the sons of every foreign land, who relationally are not from your seed. And what we determined in yesterday's program is that each stroke that comprised each of the letters, that composed each of the words, that provide us with these insights into Yahweh's guidance are brilliantly scribed. The first of these uh, says and, which means to increase and to secure. To enlarge a home, a son, which is a child born into a family with the inheritance and all that is to be gained by that home of eight, which is based on the Hebrew word meaning olive oil, from shamona, meaning shamem, which is nourishing words, provide cleansing. They provide life, uh, enabling the birth of a child, the noon, the sperm, the birth of a child into a family that is enabled to reach up, to grasp Yah's hand, to walk with him. That's what the letters communicate. That a son of eight days, Yomem, is Yahweh's hand securing and enlarging his home. It is Yahweh's hand providing cleansing and life. Yomem days. That brings us into a position of warmth and of light. You shall circumcise, you shall separate, you shall cut creating a division. You shall set apart. Mool. You should circumcise for the purpose of approaching by way of the shepherd. Law. Law is the, the shepherd's staff that, that leads and protects and guides those sheep that are part of the flock. Every male. Doesn't say males up to the point of Paul. It doesn't say, okay, Timothy, but not Titus. It says every male. Every male. It doesn't say just Jewish males. It doesn't say just Israelite males. It says every male. And the term male here, you know, we're, we're already designated male because Ben means son. The Hebrew word for son is a child born uh, with an inheritance into the family and living in the home is B-N, Ben. So we're already designated. Why would Yahweh have to say every male again? Because the word he chose for male isn't Enosh, which means mortal. It isn't Adam, which means man. It isn't Ish, which means individual. No, he chose Zakar, and the actionable verbal basis of Zakar is to remember, to memorialize. He's trying to memorialize the covenant so that we can remember it.
because it is life and death. It is relationship versus separation. He wants us to remember every aspect of this, this covenant. And so he chose the concept of separation at the vital point of the human anatomy, where men and women become come together to become not only husband and wife joined as one in marriage, but come together to become father and mother. The impetus of family, the genesis of family, where a child is born into that family to be loved, to be lifted up, to be nourished, to be protected, to be guided, to be empowered, to be enriched. All of those things so that we can enjoy one another's company. All are symbols for exactly what Yahweh is trying to achieve with his covenant family. And he wants us to remember, Zachar, your every male, for them to remember. And this we do to enable them to approach by way of the shepherd, law throughout your dwelling places and generations' door. So is this something that you just do in Yisrael when, when the children of Yisrael, having been liberated from the human oppression, religious and political and military and economic oppression, and the crucible of Egypt, are walking with Yahweh? Or is this something that you don't just do in the wilderness? You don't just do in the promised land? Didn't he just say throughout your dwelling places and generations? That would be all time, all places. That's what Dor means. Dor is comprised of three letters in Hebrew. Uh, the first of the three letters is the uh, Delet. It is a doorway. The doorway here is into God's home, into the promised land, into his family. The Wa speaks of being enriched, being empowered, being added to, being made secure, being enlarged, if you will. You know, we're going to go from three dimensions stuck in time to seven dimensions. Each dimensional increase is infinite in terms of its possibilities for us, its potential to us. We're going to walk into the presence of the light. We're going to be enlightened. All of these things are additive, which is what the wall conveys. So it's the doorway that enables us to be enriched and secured and empowered for those who are observant, the resh, the, those who use their eyes to read what Yahweh has conveyed, their ears to listen to what he has to say, their brains to process this so that we come to understand it, and then our mouths so that we can respond. That's dwelling places and generations door. All of your households, all of your extended families, all of your living places. And it's not just for the naturally born, the Yalid, those naturalized as a member of the extended family through natural childbirth in your home. So in our Beth home, and Beth home uh, family is the basis of Beth covenant. It's, it's the only difference between Beth and Bereth. Beth mean family and home. It's the B in uh, Hebrew. It's also the, the name of the letter B in Hebrew. It's drawn as the picture of a family home. And Bereth, which is Yahweh's family, is an observant in individual in the middle of it. Beath is Ben, family home. Uh, Yod, Yahweh's hand, which reaches down to lift us up, to guide us into the home. And then the, the Teth, which is Yahweh's signature on it, that, that those who come into Yahweh's home by reaching for Yahweh's hand have his signature, his name, written on us. And if you add the Rosh to family home, in this case you add the observant individual, the person who is using their eyes to read what God is saying to examine his every letter of every word, who 
listen to what he has to say by reciting his words aloud. We process that so they understand it, making the necessary connections begin to understand, and that respond to him. So that's the day of home. And this is for those who are naturally born in the home. That would mean those who are born to, uh, to covenant members, born to Israelites, born to Yehudim. But circumcision and this covenant isn't just for direct descendants of Abraham and Sarah. It's not just for the descendants of Jacob and Yishak before him. There's only one covenant, there's only one God. There's only one set of conditions to participate. There's only one doorway into it. There's only one path to God. And so everyone who wishes to be part of his family follows the same path, uses the same sign, circumcision, to be part of the same family and live in the same home. There's only so many days you shall circumcise, you shall separate. With regard and for the approach of every male, for them to remember and for them to approach the law throughout your dwelling places and generations, no matter where you live or when you live. And it's for those naturally born, Yaled, as well as those uh, and, and naturally born in the home, which is the basis of covenant, but also those really wanting to be acquired and included. Kasap, those deeply desiring, strongly yearning, and passionately longing to be purchased and obtained. Speaking of adoption here, this is Mikna of every son of foreign lands who relationally are not from your seat. So if you are a Goyam, which I am, I'm, uh, best of my knowledge, Sioux Indian and Irish, and I wanted to be part of the covenant. So there is the opportunity for me to be adopted. This is the concept of adoption. Adoption throughout human history is always about acquiring a child. And for those who are sensitive about this idea that you're buying a life, but that's really what you're doing. And if, you're, if you are a couple and you uh, uh, either one of the two of you uh, can't uh, conceive a child, uh, you know, very often many couples go to adoption. And those who have done it know that while you're not actually buying the life, <laughs> you're acquiring that child. You go to an adoption agency, you hire attorneys, you spend uh, lots of money on the birth mother, uh, and then you spend a small fortune bringing that child home, bringing that child into your family. And prior to us doing it this way, where we kid ourselves about we're not really acquiring the child, we're just paying for everything that the mother needs, uh, the birth mother needs during uh, this process, and we're paying the attorneys, we're enriching everybody along the way, uh, and uh, and doing so monetarily. Uh, previously, there wasn't the stigma associated with it. You know, if you uh, wanted, didn't have a child, you wanted a child, you could buy a child from a, uh, a couple who did not have the wherewithal to raise the child but needed um, income, and you could buy the child. And so uh, that is the, this concept of adoption has always been about acquisition. And beyond that, the, the, there is a secondary symbolism here, and that is that for us to be part of Yahweh's family, for us to be adopted into his family, for us to, to have our failings forgiven, for Yahweh to see us as perfect, for him to, to eliminate from us the consequence of our um, failures, he had to acquire us. He paid a ransom. So Yahweh very much is into the payment business for his children. He paid for every one of us. He paid a ransom. He wanted us to be part of his family, and he personally paid the ransom for us to be part of that family. And this is not a ransom paid with money, not something so trivial. This is a ransom that he paid with great personal sacrifice, not just allowing his creation, who did not know him, to torture him, 
to flail him alive, to execute on his body the most excruciating form of, of torture and death on that physical body, but then for his soul to go to the place of separation where he said, my God, my God, why have you separated yourself from me? Where the set-apart spirit left Yosha's soul and his soul went into Sheol where he paid the price for us to be part of Yahweh's family. So if you have any concern over this exchange of acquiring somebody, giving something valuable to acquire somebody that really wants to be part of your family, understand that's exactly how Yahweh enables all of us to become part of his family. He acquires us. He paid the price. He didn't acquire something trivial like money. No. With something vastly more precious. And so that's the, the concept here. You, Every male that is either naturally born into the, the uh, family of those who are direct descendants of, of Abraham and Sarah, the children of Yisrael, and every child throughout all time, in every place, in every generation, who yearns, who longs, who wants to be part of Yah's family. That was me. I wanted to be part of Yah's family. I yearned to be part of his family. He ransomed me. He paid the price to adopt me. And that is what is being conveyed here. Circumcision is for all of us. I came from a foreign land. I don't think you could be more foreign to Israel than the native tribes of, uh, of what we now refer to as North America. But it doesn't matter now. I'm adopted. I am embraced. And I was talking about uh, the, the subtle differences between adoption and uh, being naturally born into a, a family home. And you know, either way, the parents accept responsibility. But let's talk about adoption for the moment of a, say, is, uh, uh, is uh, of the age that they can make decisions, that they can express their desires. And a lot of times, a, a, uh, uh, men and women will come together where one of them previously had a child, either from a previous marriage or a previous relationship, and the, uh, uh, say, the, uh, the, New You're getting into stuff I know a lot about here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll adopt that child. Yeah, that's uh, your uh, uh, your girlfriend, uh, uh, who is now really a common law wife for the time that you've spent together. Uh, Don't and, tell her that. No. <laughs> well, that's uh, I know that's uh, that's reality of that. Uh, and uh, her son, you've adopted as as your own. Yeah, something uh, he wanted. It, something you wanted. Yeah, I introduced him as my son. He he says that really I'm his dad, so yeah. it's a pretty good, pretty good agreement we have. <laughs> yeah, and and you enjoy it. He enjoys it, but most the, of it. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> this process of uh, of adopting, when when both people choose to do so, is what yeah I was talking about here. I think that's really special. Well, it's, I think it's even more special. Really, it's the uh, it's the responsibility of it all, and it's a two way responsibility because he has right. uh, when he calls me dad, that that comes with some yeah that comes with some so that, that comes with some responsibility for him too. Yeah. Um, he, and it's the same. Yeah, he's gonna listen to what you have to say. Listen to what I have he's to say. He's gonna know that you have um, some terms and conditions for being part of the family and living in the family home. Yeah, and you know, don't go, don't, don't go out and do stuff that you know I'm not gonna, that right. I, I'm gonna be right. upset with. Right. And, yeah, and, and don't call anybody else that. Yeah, don't call anybody else that. Yeah, when you if think I'm, about if it, I'm, you know, I'm. It, yeah, when you think about it, it fits right in with exactly what the covenant is. He's in, oh, he, exactly Neil, can, Neil can do his own thing, yeah. but there are things that are going to make me upset if he goes out and does it. Yeah, if he finds somebody out there that uh, gives him money and entices him with uh, with all forms of entertainment, and he says, you know, that uh, that person will do all this stuff for me if I just refer to him as dad, I, you're, <laughs> you're going to say that's not acceptable. Yeah, and, right. and if it it might even be the case where fine, he's your dad now. You go down, you go deal with him. Right. Yeah, that's right. You, you have separated. And uh, as father, do you have some responsibilities? 
more than I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Um, no. You're responsible for uh, his protection, his shelter, his uh, clothing, his education, his nourishment, um, his enlightenment, his character, his ability to make good decisions. Are you responsible for all that, aren't you? Yeah, um, I got to show him the right way to do things. Um, Mind you, somebody else. Well, unlike somebody else, it's harder for me because I'm not I'm not perfect. Um, well, yeah, I, you know. Okay. So, but but you, I think it's actually easier for you because you're not perfect. Can I uh, can I be uh, play? Uh, I won't play devil's advocate, but uh, but well, you can play advocate it. on behalf of uh, perfect. I am a flawed individual. I, it's easier for me to provide guidance to my sons as a flawed individual who's had lots of experiences, some that worked out well and some that worked out poorly, because I've been there. I, I know what it's like. I can I can provide guidance for my children based upon my own um, struggles and, uh, and successes. I, I, yeah, I, perfect. I think it's actually more difficult, more challenging. Now, he has more capability. Uh, so it's uh, he overcomes the fact that it's more challenging for someone who is seven-dimensional and uh, and who is infinitely more powerful and and absolutely perfect and unflawed in any way and who himself has never experienced what it means to be flawed to relate to and to guide someone who is less than he is so that he can make them all that he is. I, I agree with what you're saying and the only thing I'd say to that is that I've never been a father before. And this is the first and time I've done How many people get, you know, uh, the first time I have a prior experience? Well, exactly. And um, I can make mistakes. And, you know, and, and the reason why I bring that up is that if, if I make a mistake, it, it no longer just affects me. It now affects yeah. everybody around me, and that's, uh, that's a lot of responsibility yeah. to take on. Let me, uh, let me put this in a different perspective here for you. Um, Yawa became a father for the first time with um, with uh, uh, Adam, correct? Yep, yep. And he created Adam and uh, and Chawa. Uh, in fact, his first attempt was just with Adam, and he found out, you know, that while that might have been wonderful for Yawa, it wasn't completely ideal for Adam. So he had to um, come up with a uh, an, an addendum. To his idea of being a father, I, I think I, I need really to be a father of a of, of a family where, where my siblings can can also relate to one another. So, it wasn't just Yahweh being father of one child, but fa- but the father of many children, right? Yep. So that was kind of an addendum. He kind of I, I I don't think I mean if Yahweh had intended to have two children, male and female, he would have created them male and female right at the get go. He didn't, did he? No, no. Now, when uh, Yahweh experienced the uh, the degradation of behavior that his children uh, conceived uh, when they became a uh, uh, overtly vicious uh, in their religious pursuits uh, about 5,000 years ago during the time of Noah. Did he regret having uh, conceived a man in the first place? No. He no. did. Absolutely did. Oh, he did? He oh. said, I regret it. Yeah. yeah. He said, I regret it. I regret it. I, 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 uh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Look at, look at the mess. Look how horrid this is. Look at what they're. Look at what what these these creatures that I created to be part of my family and my children, so that I could love them and they could love me and we could do things together. Look how rotten they have become. Because I gave them choice, I gave them free will, and look how rotten, how vicious, how perverted they have become. This is really saddening. And he wiped out all of humanity with an asalma, save eight individuals, didn't he? Well, those eight individuals. Yes, so yes. No, so yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Yahweh, um, in this process, because he gave us free will, which means that it's, he's perfect, but he and he wants to make his creation perfect, but for, for that relationship to be the adoption where we both choose here, you know, you really um, uh, you have to make yourself susceptible to disappointment. Right? And he does. He makes himself 
susceptible to uh, to disappointment. That's you know part of the uh, of the whole process. And and was he disappointed? Yes. And if Yahweh, you know, controlled everything such that he wouldn't become disappointed, then there wouldn't be free will. So it's it's really important that we we understand the uh, the implications of this. You know, Yahweh was a first time father too. It didn't go the way he wanted it to go. Fair enough. And I'm not saying that I, I regret anything. I just say it's the most responsibility I've ever taken on in yeah. my life. And but he did. He did. It's, it's just, it's just, I, well, what I wanted to do is to explain that we all, uh, that the human experience with a family is really the same as the uh, as Yahweh's experience. Kids don't change. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. The whole process doesn't change. It's it's uh, it's the same. It's, it's related. Absolutely. <laughs> Adam and Chawa wanted the forbidden fruit. <laughs> Neo wants exactly. a new tablet. What is going on? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's right. So <laughs> there you go. Once the uh, and it's and, and who makes that uh, that uh, iPad? The company uh, named after the bite in the apple, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, we haven't we haven't moved we haven't moved very far in the in the process. Not at all, and it's the whole no. the internet, which is the key to knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so we're really back to the, the exact same position. Yeah, I was telling us about uh, children naturally born and children uh, adopted, uh, and uh, and I'm just well, the only thing I wanted to share is that well, once a child is adopted into a family, there's no distinction between the children, and so I'm delighted to be adopted. They have all the benefits, all the enjoyment, all of the rights and privileges, all the inheritance of a naturally born child if you choose to be adopted. I just think there's actually some benefit. Being adopted, something I chose, he chose me, we, we came together by way of, uh, of choice. And, uh, you know, that's a, uh, that's a marvelous way to go about it. Well, it definitely is. It's much more agreeable at times. I mean. Right. So that's pretty with this passage. Now, if you read your English translation of this uh, passage, that is not what you're going to see. That's not how they translate these words. But it is what they mean. Now that we've considered it, I'd just like to share some insights. You know, in... Uh, we talked yesterday about the fact that uh, throughout Yahweh's testimony, eight symbolizes eternity. The letter uh, that that was used to convey eight was actually written like the infinity sign uh, today, uh, and that's why the today mankind has just taken this concept and run with it and realized that that Yahweh's symbol for infinity is the best symbol, and eight is his symbol for infinity. Uh, it's why there is an eight-day celebration uh, associated with the called-out assembly of sukkah, of shelters, which is symbolic of camping out with God for all time. Additionally, the Hebrew word for eight, as we talked, shemona, is based upon shimon, which is olive oil. In the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, olive oil is used as a metaphor for the set-apart spirit because she enlightens us, she nurtures us, she anoints us, she heals us, she cleanses us. Olive oil is not only native to Israel, the tree from which the olive comes is among the two or three longest living trees in the world. That's uh, interesting about the olive. They live for in some cases, a thousand years or more. We ought not be surprised uh, in that we were designed by the author of this instruction, but it should be noted, as we shared yesterday, that the eighth day is the perfect time to perform this minor procedure. Excessive bleeding is minimized, as is infection, because human blood coagulates most effectively and has the most antibodies at this specific time on the eighth day. It's all there for us. We were designed for this, all built into the plan, all to help us understand and remember Yahweh's coming. We'll return to his terminology and to Zakar, which shattering this continues after this. Paper. So this is the second time in, uh, in a series of just three statements about uh, circumcision. 
uh, and Yahweh telling us that circumcision will help us be observant. It will help us uh, observe the terms and conditions associated with the covenant and will help us remember the covenant. And, and as he's conveying that, this is the second time he's used Zakar, uh, specifically in association with circumcision. Since the instruction is directed toward, though not exclusive to, young boys, literally Ben sons, the reason for using Zakar only becomes obvious when you study the word's etymology. Zakar means to establish in one's memory, to remind, to remember, to reflect, to recall, and to memorialize something important, making it known. It also conveys the idea that truth can cleanse and purify, causing us to shine brightly and brilliantly. Ah, what a marvelous secondary meaning for Zakar. When we're enveloped in the set-apart spirit, her garment of light cleanses us, purifies us, and we radiate Yah's pure and brilliant light as a result. Light is eternal. Light is perfect. Light is empowers us enlightens us. Moreover, each time a parent bathes their son, they will be reminded of their commitment to raise their children in compliance with the covenant so that their children become God's children. It's all there, right, laid out before our eyes. Now, especially relevant here is that there are two different classes of individuals to be circumcised, which signifies two distinct groups of people can be become part of Yahweh's family. Abraham's direct descendants through Yishak, laughter, and Jacob, the one who digs in his heels to, to steadfastly uh, walk in the straight line along the path that Yahweh has provided and not waver left or right from it. And he became Yisrael, which means individuals who engage and endure with God. They are Yalid, naturally born into Yahweh's Bereth family. But since Yahweh has routinely promised that the benefits of the covenant would also be available to us, Goyim, people from different races and places, he has provided a provision for adoption. And that is what Kasap Mikna in this previous statement represent. Those deeply desiring to be acquired and included. It's from Nekar. Uh, they're not the word, but uh, those of us who are being adopted are from Nekar, foreign lands. These are adopted children. Hiding this reality, most English Bibles base their translations of this verse upon the Mesoretic text, where the KSP root of Kasap, longing, is pointed Kesep, money. As Kesep Mikna, the clause speaks of those who really want to be acquired and included. But as Kesep, the order of things has to be reversed, and the Mikna Kesep becomes a string of nouns, acquisition money, which is then corrupted to read, purchased with money. And yet while the Kesep Mikna really wanting to be acquired and included translation is more consistent with the covenant and more informative, the Mikna Kesep vocalization does address adoption and thus provides us with two distinct ways to be included into the covenant. Natural childbirth as a literal descendant of Abraham and by choice through adoption. And thus both renderings are acceptable when viewed from the proper perspective. By chance, should you have an aversion to adoptive parents who value a child more than the child's natural parents purchasing a child, be aware that this is exactly how Yahweh adopts us. He paid the price for us to live with him as his children. This is what Passover, unyeasted bread, and first fruits represent in our lives, in our adoption process. In fact, first fruits, Bokodim, actually means firstborn child. Passover is the doorway into Yahweh's home to eternal life. And matzah is the welcome mat which cleanses us so that we're prepared to be adopted. Shavuah, then, the promise of seven, simply conveys the consequence of that adoption. We're enriched and empowered by our Heavenly Father and spiritual mother in the covenant in that time. 
So all of this is provided for us, whether we are naturally born or we are adopted. We have the opportunity to be part of the most wonderful family, God's family, and to live with him in his home forever, which is the symbolism now of the eighth day and of Zakar telling us that this is the way that we will recall this wonderful sign of the covenant.